The Key to the Kalevala, Part 3 Hekka Urvest English translation by Tapio Jonesu, edited by John Major Jenkins We gratefully acknowledge the great good fortune of being granted permission by Ino Freiberg to use his 1988 English translation of the Kalevala. The Kalevala's Magic, the Occult Historical Key What is meant here by magic? Magic is usually understood to mean a sorcery or witchcraft used to increase material benefits in a way more expedient than conventional methods. It is said to be good or white magic if one has beneficial aspirations for oneself and friends. On the other hand, it is considered to be bad or black magic if it is used to damage others. Alan Menzies writes in his book History of Religion. 1895, quote starts, every savage religion contains a certain amount of magic, of practices, that is to say, by which it is thought possible to influence or to foretell outward events. Early man is not limited in his views of what may happen by any accurate knowledge of natural laws, or of the sequence of cause and effect, and he imagines it possible to influence nature in various ways. He imitates what he supposes to be the causes of things judging that the effect will also follow, or he uses such powers as he may have over spirit, to induce or compel them to accomplish his wishes, or he manipulates objects he believes to have a hidden virtue, in a way he believes calculated to bring about the desired result. Magic is thus related both to the cult of spirits and to that of casual objects, both to animism and to fetishism. There is generally a special person in a tribe who knows these things, and is able to work them. Quote ends, it almost feels like Professor Menzies calls into question the revival of learning regarding magic and mysticism, and would brand all of it as being mere superstition and belief in illusion. On a more cautious and correct scientific foundation there is Professor Heinrich Schertz, who says in his book The Original History of Culture quote starts, The scientist of modern times has encountered many difficult problems in his search for answers. A more in-depth exploration of hypnotism has shown that negativity and arguments inciting skepticism are insufficient as explanation, and that many facts found among tribal cultures that appear to be mysticism actually have a scientifically provable foundation. Nevertheless, for example, the convenient position that all shamans and medicine men were simply skilled jesters and conjurers has to be abandoned quote ends. In the minds of their neighbors, the Finns and Laps were always considered to be powerful magicians and sorcerers, and of course they had their reasons for believing this. No other Christian nation has preserved as many magic formulas and incantations than our nation. See Agotland writes in his study the wisdom and teaching methods of the old Finns. Quote starts, they is first mentioned for the fact that no other nation in the world is more famous for their magic and witchcraft than this Finnish nation. These traditions have risen to a uniform doctrine or knowledge, which appears to the outside world via brutal and curious icons, and through odd events, none of which have been studied. This doctrine expresses some vanity, but also much great knowledge and wisdom, which explain how, although the Finns may have lived mostly in mental darkness, they had a natural but odd wisdom, quite magnificent though it turned unnatural, which expressed itself in a peculiar manner. With their wisdom and vanity they frightened other nations and they were considered more powerful and knowledgeable than other human beings. Indeed, it has been said that they were in union with the devil, that they received both their wisdom and power from him. Humans have always been quick to explain incomprehensible events as unnatural, and if the practicing of magic betrayed the Finns as unenlightened, those who believed this could not be any wiser than those who practiced and trusted in it. Quote ends, a long time ago, in 1782, Lenkvist's study of the old Finns' theoretical and practical superstitions, written in Latin, was published in Turku, because it listed and classified magical phenomena more thoroughly than works that came later, as we have seen. We wish to repeat here Porth and Lenkvist's classification. The official skills of incantation or white magic were of the following kinds. 1. Prophesying performed with a bowl or goblet filled with water, be a patient's garment, see presentiments or precognition, de-lottery, and e-choosing days. Presentiments were omens of future events and were seen in many kinds of occurrences and accidental events. A buzzing in the ears augured that some kind of news would be heard, meeting an old woman, stumbling against a threshold, and falling from a horse's back were supposedly bad omens. A jackdaw's cawing, a cat's mewing, and an itching in the cheeks and chin meant the arrival of guests. Omens of death were of many kinds. 
For example, a knocking made against a wall was death's clock, as were the howl of dogs and the eagle owl's cry, or pieces of straw or wood chips seen lying in the shape of a cross in front of a door and so on. The choosing of days was apparently based upon astrological knowledge. They had their happy and unhappy days. For example, the final days of a waning moon and the first days of a waxing moon were empty days because the moon is not visible during that time. As such, it was not good to sow or spread manure over a field during those days. Two charms, with which sorcerers fortified themselves against harm and accidents caused by other sorcerers, also used to deflect such attacks. Incantation techniques were used to make their bodies invincible to all kinds of weapons, to guard cattle against wild beasts, to protect their dwellings from fire and their transport wagons from thieves, and successfully defend legal disputes. By taking oaths they tried to prevent the forces of nature from causing damage, and dangerous animals from causing harm. See, with conjurings they tried to drive away bears, diseases and other evil from themselves and friends. T by enlisting or engaging one was believed to be able to repel the intrigues and plans of bad people who try to injure others with their magic tricks. E by turning around one could protect oneself from the dangers and injuries raised by an enemy. In this way, the masters of this skill tried to throw back these evil things upon the sender. F by reversing, sorcerers tried to heal injuries and return lost objects. Thus, for example, they forced thieves to return stolen objects and could compel a divorced woman to love her husband again. 3. Catching or bringing happiness This was done with many kinds of secret tricks, partly with the aid of some kind of home spirit who provides his friends with riches, money, and other goods. Incantation skills for evil deeds, or black magic, were of the following kinds. 1. Conjuration with their spells magicians can confuse the abilities of other human beings to the extent that they lose control and seem to hear, see, and feel things that the magician wants them to, and thereby injure themselves. Lengthus lists that the eyes, ears, tongue, and imagination can be betrayed, tells how someone can be made to go out of their mind, how mobility is reduced or stopped entirely, and how one can determine another person's feelings as much as one desires. Nowadays, all of these phenomena are called hypnotism, Two bewitching in the limited sense that by wicked tricks they watch over another person's life, successes, and property with criminal intent and do not consider such activities to be shameful as long as they are done secretly and safely. For this purpose a special lumbago or hernia was used, described as a ball, which caused severe pain in the internal organs of the body such that death would certainly follow. They could also trouble their enemies with diseases or make them melancholic, paralyzed, blind, or lame. They sought to disturb other people's marriages and make them unhappy, infertile, quarrelsome, or in some other way miserable. They even tried to deprave an enemy's character by compelling him to become a thief, an adulterer, a drinker, a spendthrift, or make him a profligate by similar means. Three buttings and curses. With these, a mouthful of abuse was heaped upon the enemy or opponent whom had wished for evil things, and ruin was wished upon the enemy's whole tribe as well as the enemy himself. These were accomplished with specific ceremonies and magic formulas, in addition to all kinds of other wicked techniques. Regarding the devices and techniques employed in the ceremonies of both black and white sorcerers, Lengfist mentions 1. Magic signs, being letters, numbers, and other kinds of signs. Also, we can include here 2. Magic objects such as sieves, magic drums, and so on. Three words, which is to say, words and short sentences with which diseases were removed, serpents were charmed, and so on. Four spells, that is, words of origin, the essential spells. Five ceremonies and tricks. He must, before sunrise, go around visiting cemeteries and bury human bones here and there, never looking around or throwing anything behind himself. Hang a magic object around the neck or on the breast, without blinking an eye. One must run a specified distance holding one's breath, and so on. 6. Miraculous Enthusiastic Emotions and Pranks If one needs to chase away evil spirits one sets about this task with tremendous emotion, raging with pranks, rumbling around, contorting the body in and out. 7. Unions with Devils There is no doubt that the kind of people who have gone so long in ungodliness and stupidity, initiating themselves with the enemy of God and humanity, seeks to receive eternal help for their wicked plans. It is true that the seed of ungodliness originates in paganism, 
This is true because we have shown above that our ancestors believed one could enlist the help of evil gnomes and spirits. In this broad summary, we see a satisfactory overview of the secret techniques, as far as they are understood, which are usually referred to as magic or witchcraft. The Kalevala is full of this magic. All of its heroes are skilled in incantations, including Lemminkainen, Ilmarinen, Jalkahainen, and above all Vainamoinen, whose mighty words and songs were not merely charming, but carried with them a creative and miracle-making force, as an example of a magical object. There is Lemminkainen's hairbrush, which his mother and wife saw bleeding at the moment he met his death. At one point, when the moon and sun cease to shine, Vainamoinen turns to divination by lottery three. It is also said that he cured sick people with ointments and magnetic gazes, as well as with prayers and spells. At any rate, one's attention never becomes fixed on these magical details because they appear to be wholly natural and minor points. The clue, however, is their lofty content and their aesthetic unity, which awakens a deep and permanent interest. But the question that every attentive reader must ask is, what foundation and basis is there for such stories? And many a reader answers without doubt, certainly none. Caution is needed here. Reactionary denials are too easy and quick. As Professor Schertz remarked in the quotation given above, the modern investigator is no longer in the same position as the scientist during the revival of learning, the Renaissance. Currently, we officially know enough about the secret faculties of the human mind that we mark ourselves as ignorant. Scientific fuddadud is if we just shrug our shoulders at fairy tales and miraculous stories. Regarding the writer of this book, he has no reason to deny the reality of magic and magical phenomena. On the contrary, he, based on his own experiences, must confess that several of the phenomena given above are real, and he could even mention a few that are not listed. However, this does not mean that he would morally approve of them. It does not surprise us that common opinion and the many critics who condemn witchcraft and magic adhere to a philosophy of life that does not reach beyond the concerns of everyday mundane life. Perpetual worrying about the benefits and needs of material life, its success, security, and well-being, is really vile and overly concerned with details. Certainly, honest work and sincere behavior are no doubt much better magic in the long run than any spells and tricks. Education, civilization, and the Christian outlook have an undeniably elevating effect on nations. But common opinion and critique depends upon the understanding of magic that ultimately prevails. If the comprehension changes, so must the critical analysis. We do not in the least wish to change common opinion about magic. We only want to publicly express our own opinion, which may already be clear to the reader. That essentially, and in truth, magic is quite different from the picture of tricks and spells presented above. In reality, magic involves activity in the unseen world and thus knowledge of the unseen world. A seer is just a human being who controls some of the forces in the unseen world, and therefore his actions as a seer seem magical, far removed from the idea that this activity can impinge upon the realm of material and physical life. Its aims are in fact superphysical, mental, and moral in quality. True magic only touches physical being indirectly. It only promotes a spiritual civilization. The magic of the other kind, when it truly appropriates the secret forces, is like prostituting the divine faculty. With his magical abilities a seer expresses his contribution to the surrounding world and humanity. One part of his activities is simply education. His task is to educate humanity, to have an effect on them, perhaps even to acquire some of them as pupils. Thus we can say that magic, in this more limited meaning, is the psychic method which a seer uses when helping human beings to grow and when seeking to enlist students. In the following we want to explain a few features regarding these educational methods of the Kalvala seers, and then it may become clear why we generally refer to them as magical. Then and now, two human types. For us to correctly understand the education and magic offered by the Kalvala seers, we must first review the essentials, the human environment where they first found themselves and had influence. That environment cannot be found in the era in which the modern form of the Kalvala runes were composed and sung, but must be sought in a much older period, the time of which the Kalvala's runes, at least certain fragments of them, truly speak. We do not wish to define how far back we need to go with a specific number of years. The Kalvala, as we will see, sings of so many periods and eras that we are accessing a span of tens of thousands of years. We must go so far back that we meet with a psychological environment markedly different from modern humanity, 
and this is the first era which was influenced by the seer heroes of the Kalvala. Despite the suspicions of our scientific investigators, the Kalvala takes us, if we can see and feel the magical ambience, to very ancient eras beyond history, to a time when the modern Finnish nation did not yet exist although our ancestors, and why shouldn't we call them Finns, were alive and making their mark. The origins and past history of the Finnish people are hidden in dim antiquity. But occultly seen this is a known quantity, our Kalvalan spirit and culture are of Atlantean origin. As to its form and its expressive style, the Kalvala is naturally an Aryan product, but when one ventures into its spirit, Atlantean images and impressions arise, and therefore we must correctly understand the Kalvala's magic to begin to comprehend the psyche and soul of the Atlantean human. We spoke earlier about humanity's fourth root race and mentioned that these Atlanteans were more emotional human beings than those in the modern fifth Aryan root race. However, this short definition is insufficient. To get some kind of image of the Atlantean human it will be useful to compare with the modern European. How can we psychologically define the modern human being? His innermost secret essence is emotion but he more or less uses his intellect to control himself and his actions. Officially, he admits that reason is supreme and regrets that it doesn't always prevail in his private life. Besides, he has a dim feeling that the intellect is much more than simply concerned with resourcefully and egotistically calculating things for its own benefit. His day consciousness is essentially the activity of thought. A human being who cannot use his reasoning intellect while in the day consciousness is sick and is considered to be a lunatic in relation to other human beings. The modern human being's thought life is based upon his perceptions, which come at through his senses. For him, sleep consciousness is shadowy and dim, often confused and lacking in reason, and he makes a sharp distinction between his day and sleep consciousness. The more he becomes European, the more independent he tries to be. The psychological impulse of civilization is found in the fact that it impels him to become an individual and personal being. He is his own self, not merely his father's son, or a member of this or that family or tribe. His motto is individual freedom and he wishes for free competition to prevail as much as possible in his society. In their innermost beings all humans are unchanging but in their personalities they change according to times and conditions. How different was the Atlantean personality compared with the European? The average Atlantean was not nearly as developed in his reasoning ability and use of thought. He was not at all as independent, not as individualized. He did not have his own will. In all things he thought and perceived with the same eyes as his parents, his kin, and his tribe. It was as if he lived in them, and they in him, and the deceased were always present in his memory. He was almost completely feeling and fantasy. He was more a part of a group soul than an isolated individual soul. And this reveals the original psychological background for the worshipping of the deceased, in addition, his day consciousness was organized differently than that of a modern human being. It consisted of very little thought and reason and instead the world appeared to him as being full of emotion. This means that a great deal of what we nowadays call sleep consciousness then belonged to the day consciousness. The Atlantean mind was full of sleep images. The emotions of other people entered the mind as images. Speech was not used in the same way as it is today. And the physical perceptions of human beings and animals were, especially in the earlier Atlantean ages, seen to be dimmer than the emotions. Nature spoke to Atlantean souls in its own language. Flowers in the meadow, stones on the earth, trees in the forest, lakes, mountains, clouds, wind, thunder, sun, moon, and stars, all reflected specific sentimental images within their consciousness. So it is not difficult to understand why the ancient nations in their thinking were animists. Among the ancient cultures that we are familiar with, manism and animism were inherited straight from the ancient Atlantean. But there is another reason for Atlantean animism. Because an Atlantean's day consciousness partially moved in the sleep world. He not only perceived the emotions of nature, but also the invisible beings of nature, which are called fairies. These are partly fantastical forms constantly vanishing away, having their source in the internal streaming of elemental life coming from the vegetable kingdom, the air, water and wind, and partly living beings, actual fairies and nature spirits which live within the elements and belong to a wholly other developmental system than human beings and animals. Today, when a clairvoyant occultist encounters this living realm, these fairies in the invisible world, he confidently controls them with his thoughts and will. The Atlantean could not manage to control in this way. 
because his thought was not developed enough. He could not use his willpower self-consciously. He had to rely on his emotion to awaken his will. How is this possible? With spells, the Atlantean had an excellent memory. By early childhood he had already committed to memory many kinds of spells and words of origin. He needed these in everyday activities and with their help he conversed with nature and its beings, sometimes praying for their help, sometimes controlling them with his conjuring and spells. When an Atlantean slept, his consciousness moved to that part of his mind which we call the inner consciousness much easier than does the consciousness of the modern human being. Nowadays, when a sleeper has enjoyed dreamless sleep, he awakens and feels especially strong and invigorated. He descended from sleep consciousness into the inner consciousness, and this distancing from his everyday worries, to rest in the bosom of his own inner being, naturally replenishes his physical and ethical reserves. An Atlantean experienced this every night, suggesting a reason why ancient people were usually more healthy than modern humans. When they became ill, a person was cured by having them fall asleep in a holy place such as a temple, thus interacting in the world of the inner consciousness with the good and pure fairy of the holy place made him well. Also, because the disease manifested in the consciousness as a mental image, a physician, that is, a healer or seer using spells and conjurations, could drive away the mental image and with it the disease. Moreover, the sleep state of the Atlantean differed in several essential respects from modern dreamless sleep. When a modern human being awakens from a deep, dreamless sleep, he does not remember anything. He thinks he spent the whole night in an unconscious state. It was different for the Atlanteans. For them, falling into the inner consciousness was similar to what happens when modern human beings shift to the sleep consciousness. Upon awakening, the Atlantean brought memories back. He visited another world. His soul moved in the realms of the deceased and the gods, associating with higher beings and participating in the world's cosmic life. Today, native people still believe that while they sleep the soul floats around in strange lands. Nowadays, however, if one wants to preserve the memories from the inner consciousness, one must learn the special mental training of falling into a trance, which we mentioned earlier. Keeping in mind these psychophysiological differences, or soul body differences, between the ancient Atlantean and the modern European, we can understand without further ado that their methods of education regarding magic are also essentially different. Let us imagine that a seer of our times wishes to turn the world's attention to the wisdom of the ages, to the existence of the secret knowledge, to the possibility of salvation from evil, and that he wishes to gather pupils around him. What means would he use? There exists only one honest and efficacious method, to awaken the human being's thought and intellect to action, to appeal to their own sense of truth and justice, to urge them to seek the truth and to show them the way. This is best accomplished through the spoken and written word. The modern human being is so sensitive to any kind of influence and authority that he considers, for example, religious ceremonies in church and other festivities which, in the Middle Ages, inspired the human mind to devotion and saintliness as a downright sterile system devoid of reason and free thought. And if a white magician tries to acquire and educate pupils in the secret knowledge and wisdom, he should explain to them immediately, at the very start, the difference between blind faith and natural human trust and show them that occult self-education is in no respect unreasonable, that, in fact, the development of reason is one of its essential trademarks. To be brief, reason exists in the modern-day consciousness as the accepted master, and one must petition it during the magic education of adult human beings. Not until the reasoning day consciousness cooperates can a human being benefit from his faith in his divinely born eye and be truly enthusiastic about seeking and approaching it. Let us think about the human seer who lived thousands of years ago on Atlantis. He too wanted to educate human beings in how to live rightly. He too wanted to awaken in them the desire and feeling of God and the knowledge of truth. His duty was also to gather around him pupils, to show them how they could accelerate their development and be elevated to the feeling of the higher eye, that which saves one from evil. Was he, that ancient seer, in the same situation as his brother of our times? Could he appeal to the same experiences of his pupils and, above all, to the same intellectual understanding? Not at all. His position was quite different. The real eye, to which he could appeal, was of another order completely. The minor faculty of reason that he might awaken was extremely weak and ineffectual. But, in contrast to this, there was a great emotional force and an expansive and sensitive imagination. In this situation, how could one overlook the psychic faculty? 
that side of consciousness which was clearly in the foreground and the most developed. Naturally, a seer of that era had to appeal to the imagination and emotional force of human beings. How could this be done? It was done with the help of a method that today we would perhaps call suggestion. That is, suggestion but not hypnotism. Hypnotism, in a limited definition, means the chaining of another person's will and consciousness so that he loses his independent thought and self-control. It is like sinking into an artificial sleep. A white Atlantean seer did not use this to teach magic because with this approach there could be no benefits in that era. Only damage. The cult development is based upon self-education, and it cannot begin by arresting learning. The suggestive state that the ancient seer induced involved liberating his pupil from the group soul or the group dream which he was subject to, and he had to use suggestion to awaken a will to freedom and independence within his student. This suggestion awakened experiences that were stronger than those in everyday emotional life, opening the imagination to wider and more interesting vistas. This usually began when the seer awoke self-love in his pupil. In the earliest times, he did not need to use suggestion for this purpose. His very presence, the exuberant love emanating from his heart, spontaneously struck responsive chords in sensitive human beings. Undeniably, however, in later times a seer did rely on the power of his imagination to draw the pupil's heart and attention near. There was no danger unless the seer was inexperienced. All emotion draws its expressive force from human sexuality, as we remarked earlier. When love was thus kindled in the pupil's breast, a relationship developed between him and the teacher. This relationship was unavoidable and was good as long as it stayed pure and unselfish. It helped the pupil become free from the dream of the tribal soul and allowed the teacher to educate his student in reason and independence. Gradually, the student grew free from his teacher's influence. On the other hand, things were different if the seer was inexperienced or egotistical. Then he would lapse into the personal vicissitudes of his own awakening love, and the relationship between teacher and student could turn selfish, even physical. We cannot deny that some teachers, whose reason and imagination were superior, used these forces wrongly and for selfish reasons to gain power over their weaker students. Today, great intelligence and cunning could also be used wrongly, if not simply by appealing to the emotions then by seducing and arresting the comprehending intellect of others. The way of black magic is always open. Regarding Atlantean magic, in general terms we can say that it was based on emotion and therefore on sexual power. Atlantean magic in the Kelvala when we spoke of the Kalvala's internal ethic, we tried to open the meaning of some runes with the psychological key of self-education. This is a general procedure, independent of time, which does not touch upon the Kalvala's historical content. Now our duty is quite different. Now we must understand the Kalvala as an occult historical description of time and approach its heroes as if they were human types who lived on Earth. We say human types because, as we already said in Chapter 5, the names of the Kalvala's heroes are generic or familial names, typical in the respect that they were given to many individuals. Also, in using the key of Atlantean magic we cannot yet approach our heroes as personalities who walked the earth. Why? Because the Kalvala's external poetry and format are not Atlantean, so its Atlantean contents must be sought within it. The Kalvala's runes are songs assembled during the Aryan Age, for Aryan listeners. And its viewpoint is Aryan, however old some of its contents may be. By using the historical key which unlocks for us the Atlantean side of the Kalvala's magic, we begin by assuming that the Kalvala's main heroes, Vainamoinen, Ilmarinen, Lemminkainen, and Lauhai are Atlantean magicians, and the last one mentioned represents the so-called black magic. Vainamoinen, Ilmarinen and Lemminkainen were white magicians who sought students to promote humanity's development. Their students are described as young maidens. And this is to show, besides the fact that students' souls are always receptive and thus feminine in relation to the teacher, that they are inexperienced and predisposed to innocent goodliness. This was relevant because the educational process appealed to the emotions and the imagination. We don't mean to suggest that students were always women and teachers were always men. Teachers are described as men because a teacher's position is one of outward giving. Lemminkainen is a typical Atlantean magician. When we understand him correctly with this in mind, he appears as great, strong, and lovable. He is full of knowledge, his emotions are invincible, and he is an untiring ally. His countless love adventures record the many times that he helped human souls with his love. 
for he was a great lover and he trusted infinitely in his own personal charms. Since my house is not so high, and my kinship not so great, with my handsome frame I'll conquer, capture with my other features. He always appealed to the emotions, and with them he could easily awaken the emotions of others. However, although he was prone to hint at his own irresistibility, he rarely appealed to the imagination. He was vigorously strong, faithful, and confident in himself. The one who pleased him, she who he chose to educate, could not resist. The island's Kaliki stubbornly tried to resist and stand firm. But when Lemminkainen arrived and opened to her his burning heart, her strength broke and she was happy to surrender to Lemminkainen's lead. He went along on his way with the clarity of purpose and straightforwardness of a hurricane. He finally learned to see that his personal charm and power were not enough. When he did not meet within the island's population souls whom he might teach in the way he wished, he made up his mind to journey to Pojola where was said to exist a proud and beautiful nation familiar with the secret skills. After arriving he realizes that he must appeal to the imagination as well as the emotions. He thus set about singing and conjuring with such charisma that the best singers in the place felt inadequate and ineffective. Their reservoir of poetry and magic dried up and their imaginations wilted powerlessly under Lemminkainen's will. From his coat hem fire was streaming, in his eyes a light was gleaming, as the son of Lempi sang. As he sang and worked his magic, sang the best of singers down, made of them the worst of singers, fed their mouths with pebbles edgewise, boulder after boulder flatwise, heaped upon the best of them, best magicians, best of singers, all such miserable men he scattered, hither and yon to barren tundras, fields unplowed, and fishless ponds, without a single swimming perch, to the mighty falls of Finnmark, into the boiling, whirling maelstrom, into foam beneath the current, there as boulders in mid-rapids, conjured them to flame like fire, and to flash like shooting sparks. One of the listeners, wet hat the cow herder, remained untouched, unaffected by Lemminkainen's song and, wondering to himself, perhaps waiting for some compliment, he finally asked Lemminkainen why he had been spared. In all sincerity, Lemminkainen answered, You are bad, a worthless human, you have not a drop of imagination's holy fire, thus even my own divine song had no effect on you. This was taken as an insult by all present, and the cow herder decided to plan his revenge. After demonstrating his power, Lemminkainen made it known that he now desired students. Lauhai responded that this would not be a problem, but first he had to prove his seer knowledge before they would agree to fully believe in him. In accomplishing these works for wages Lemminkainen shows that he is capable of many kinds of conjuring, but in completing his final task he collapses onto the earth, unconscious. The black forces of the cow herder of Poja were superior. Lemminkainen could not protect himself against those magic arrows. Later, when Lemminkainen makes his second journey to Pojola, he cannot do anything among the cold-blooded people of Pojola. Vainamoinen, when understood as an Atlantean seer, is of a different type than Lemminkainen. He does not appeal directly to the emotions when awakening the attention of human beings. He lets the fame of his wisdom set to motion their imaginations, and then his personal presence and singing completely charms them. His basic approach differs from Lemminkainen's, and it is not as effective when looked at from the Atlantean perspective. He did not, in fact, manage to acquire any students among human beings. Only seers like Ilmarinen and Lemminkainen could follow his lead. Anyhow, Vainamoinen is so famous by the time he arrives in Pojola that he is received with great respect and affection, is entertained and asked to stay. But Vainamoinen longs for his own country, and he does not trust the people of Pojola. After a while it becomes clear that they are an egotistical secret group, for Lauhai asks Vainamoinen. So, what will you give me then, if I see you safely home, see you to your homeland meadows, even to your very sauna? When Vainamoinen offers her helmetfuls of gold, Pojola's mistress answers that gold is merely children's flowers and asks Vainamoinen if he can forge a sampo, and if he agrees to do it. Then I'll let you have my daughter, give the maiden as her payment and I'll see you safely home. Because he cannot forge the Sampo himself, Vainamoinen promises to send Smith Ilmarinen to both forge the Sampo and appease the maiden. However, on his journey homeward, he spies Poja's beautiful virgin, is charmed by her and asks her to follow him. Thus, there was at least one person in Pojola who, in Vainamoinen's eyes, was worthy of educating as his own pupil. Poja's maiden was not agreeable right away. 
for she wanted to confirm that Vainamoinen was truly a seer who could conjure. She makes Vainamoinen cleave a horsehair with a dull knife, tie an egg into a knot, scrape birch bark from a stone, and chop fence posts of ice without splitting off a splinter. Finally, when Vainamoinen must carve a boat from the crumblets of the virgin's spindle and push it into the water without a hand upon it, he could not do it right away and succumbs to all kinds of problems. When Vainamoinen finally finishes the boat and brings it to Poja's virgin, she is already engaged to another seer, Ilmarine. Vainamoinen wisely resigns himself to his fate, for he himself had sent Ilmarine into Pojola and was thus responsible for the people of Pojola being charmed by Ilmarine and claiming him as their teacher. Ilmarine is a lesser type of Atlantean seer. If we imagine him seeking students, he would not appeal to their emotions at all, and in his personal presence he barely makes any impression on the imagination. The only way that he might awaken interest is to let his works and deeds speak for him. But, in fact, Bakilvala does not say that Ilmarinen, out of love for humanity, seeks students. Not until he goes to Pojola at Vainamoinen's bidding does there awaken within his heart a desire to join with the people of Pojola. But when those whom he desires to have his students create obstacles for him, he sadly returns to his own country. Anyhow, he did forge the Sampo for the people of Pojola, which is to say, he taught them many things that they did not or could not know and eventually, as fate would have it, those chosen by Ilmarinen do become his students. As we already said, Lauhai, the mistress of Pojola, represents black magic. This is apparent because she has ambitions for power and knowledge. In connection with her, there are no words of love. She judges Lemminkainen to be insignificant. When she desires Vainamoinen for her son-in-law, she secretly thinks of all the knowledge and power which she could draw from him. And although Vainamoinen is too wise to teach Lauhai, he falls into her coils to the extent that he must promise the task to Ilmarinen, and Lauhai easily bends Ilmarinen to her will. Ilmarinen is too honest to expect evil, and he teaches all of his secret abilities to Lauhai. He eventually gets his reward, and belatedly observes that he taught his skills to many people who would misuse them for their own well-being and power. Finally, fate strips everything from Ilmarine, which is fortunate because he then understands that his duty is to retrieve all the power and knowledge that he squandered in Pojola. The Kilvala identifies Pojola as the stronghold of black magic and sorcery. Many a reader might say that Lemminkainen, for his part, is much blacker. His method of using his personal charms to awaken others is almost detestable, and the Kelvala really describes him in no uncertain terms. It truly finds him at fault to be always playing around with women. And so it goes. That is the way things seem in Aryan eyes. And what better proof of this than the fact, which we already mentioned, that the Kelvala was composed from the Aryan viewpoint. But alas, times change, and we along with them. What seems black today could have been white yesterday, and vice versa. We see here that it is not enough to look at a dog's hair. We must examine the roots. We must penetrate closer to the Kelvala's heroes. At the Change of Ages In the previous chapter we made a general overview of the lives of the Kelvala's main heroes from the vantage point of Atlantean magic, but did not exhaust the Kelvala's occult historical content. You see, since the Kelvala was composed during the Aryan Age, it does not speak only of Atlantean memories. When we examine the Kelvala's magical content more precisely, we will find that the Kelvala refers to at least three periods, the Atlantean, the Aryan, and the critical stage in between. If we can see that the ancestors of the Finnish nation once lived as an Atlantean tribe in the highlands of Central Asia, eight afterward wandering into Middle, Southern, and Eastern Europe and finally settling in the North. We understand how they became quite Aryan upon arriving in Europe, perhaps even earlier, and why the Kelvala preserves memories from different epochs. As a true remnant in memory of the Atlantean Age, there is the description of Lemminkainen. As we already mentioned, this Kelvala hero was a typical Atlantean magician, and Kaliki represents the people of the island, the place where he most enjoyed his sojourn and was most successful. We have already discussed Lemming Cannon in great detail, so here we only wish to add a few more observations which confirm that he was a genuine Atlantean. Lemming Cannon deeply loved and trusted his mother, and his insubordination only shows that he had become more independent than the ordinary Atlantean, with just cause one can certainly say that he loved no one as much as his mother. While traveling around outdoors, then facing all kinds of dangers, he always turns to using spells. For example, 
The brush that he leaves is an omen is filled with his own magnetic power. He has merged with it in such a way that if it starts bleeding, his mother and Kaliki will know that things are going badly with him. Also, he is quite warlike and often draws his sword on living beings, especially human beings, when his spells do not work. On the other hand, Ilmarinen belongs completely to the Aryan Age, and Poja's maid represents the human souls whom he managed best. Earlier we described Ilmarinen's intellectual and, appearance-wise, somewhat cold character, so we will be satisfied here to mention only a few more things. In this way we will see that Ilmarinen's blood had hardly a trace of the Atlantean. He never turns to incantations but only to works and deeds. He is the eternal smith. When he utters a prayer or a wish, it is brief and terse, not at all like an incantation, but more like what might arise within the breast of one of us. For example, when he leaves for Pojola and sits down in the sleigh, he prays. O thou Ukko, send down new snow, new fine snow in powdery flakes, for my sleigh to slide on swiftly, slippery snow to speed my way, and adds a wish. May good fortune bless my reins, God be with me in my sleigh. Good luck will not break the reins, Jumala never wreck a sleigh. While doing his works for wages it is said that he used a spell, namely, the words for removing snakes, but this can be historically understood as Metatron a birth of fire rune, in which Ilmarinen reads the words about the soothing of burns, is so transparently mythological in content that it cannot be counted as historical. Ilmarinen has no hypnotic or suggestive abilities. Another Aryan feature in his character is the ability to easily kindle an accurate intuition and presentiment of a thing's true nature, a trust in the five senses. This occurs at the very beginning of Ilmarinen's first appearance in the Kelvala. Vainamoinen returns from his misadventure in Pojola Downcast, upset that he ransomed Ilmarinen to release his own head. When he describes the delightful virgin of Poja to Ilmarinen and urges him to immediately leave for Pojola, Ilmarinen, seeing what really happened, cries out, Oh ho, you old sly one, you, so already you have pledged me, to that twillet Pojola, for the safety of your own head, as a ransom for yourself. And when Vainamoinen weaves a story about the moon glimmering in the high branches of a spruce tree, Ilmarinen counters, I do not believe that's true, since I have not been to see it, have not seen it with these eyes. Vainamoinen truly must use his best magic skills, including the ability to transport physical objects from one place to another to make Ilmarinen go to Pojola. The third piece of evidence regarding Ilmarinen's Aryan nature involves the forging of the Sampo. Though the Sampo is the perfect magical object, one cannot make it with magic spells. For example, Vainamoinen can build a boat with the power of song but he refuses to take on the task of forging the Sampo. This proves that the Sampo is something quite new, unheard of, something which cannot be brought about solely with the power of emotion and imagination. The forging of the Sampo requires ingenuity, reason, and thought. The Sampo thus involves higher scientific education and its achievements, all based on the faculty of intelligence and a complicated material culture, the distinctive features of the fifth root race. Also, the multicolored cover of the Sampo can, with good reason, be understood as something like a book, on which the original information and teachings of Ilmarinen were recorded with secret signs. It is no wonder that Laohai wanted to retain the Sampo as her most valuable treasure. It thus seems as if Ilmarinen, the forger of the Sampo, has stepped into the ranks of the educators and benefactors of our Aryan race as an ambassador of Finland's people. And what about Vainamoinen? He is as far from Lemminkainen as he is from Ilmarinen. He is an Atlantean magician and he is not. He is intellectually developed like an Aryan, but is not a child of the fifth root race. He is the wisest of all, wiser than the white Ilmarinen, wiser than Lemminkainen, wiser than the black Lauhai. But he is a tragic person, for his childlike personality is of the intermediary age, not belonging completely to either the old or the new. This is observed in his relationship with Aino. The only one of the Kalvala's women whom one may put on the same level with Vainamoinen in terms of the soul's secret magnificence and its tragic conflicts. For the scientist, Aino's magnificent personality and the meaning of her fate is a most absorbing and rewarding topic of study. So let us try to understand Vainamoinen as a living, wise, but suffering human individual. Vainamoinen and Aino Vainamoinen was old, old in his wisdom and old in age, but not old in his soul and mind. 
He had a long stretch of living behind him and when he glanced in that direction there arose in his memory several beautiful deeds done for his people's benefit. He did make mistakes, who hasn't? But he sincerely tried to fulfill the mission which had fallen to him. So many human souls he had educated, parents had entrusted him with their children. With poetry and singing, by telling fairy tales and making miracles, he drew to himself their young hearts and thus helped them arise from the toils of tribalism and familial blood. He had washed them clean of original sin and awoke within them their eye consciousness, taught them the elements of thought and led their first groping steps on the way of independence and knowledge. Many people were thankful former students of his. He was always welcome in thousands of homes. He was famous overseas and in many lands. However, his heart was empty, because he, the old, wise, and famous Vainamoinen felt lonely and rejected. The ancient wise men always chose one of their students early on to be a close friend and relation. They married while young so that when age overtook them they would have no regrets. As for Vainamoinen, he had many opportunities in his youth to take one with unbroken vows to be his own. He remembered several parents who wished in their hearts that he might take their daughter to be his hen under arm. He remembered many girls, many young maidens, virtuous and beautiful, who certainly would have blushed if he approached them as a suitor. But he always remained aloof. His heart never jumped so uncontrollably that he thought his day had come, and he could not follow the advice of others in those matters. And so the years passed and Vainamoinen became an elder, and he continued to live alone. Then fate put Jalkahainen in his way. When he subdued the young fanatic with his conjuring skills and was promised the young Aino, Vainamoinen's heart stirred strangely. Where did this sudden joy come from? Was it an omen? Would he now have a friend for his old age? Would he now meet a soul whom he could adore, a student whom he would be allowed to give everything to? How good he would be then, how gentle and considerate, holding hands with his best friend, the soul he would lead through gardens of knowledge, strolling down wide lanes of visions and dreams of the future. He would coax music from golden strings of emotion, make musical tones to clothe his alluring song, and he would teach his sole companion to rise into the firmament and sit on the rainbow's rim so that he, in glory, could step forward and greet her. What then could possibly separate their hearts? Steadfast old Vainamoinen, the eternal seer, had given himself to fantasies. It portended something. It portended a great sorrow. Vainamoinen eventually met Aino in the forest, bending birch twigs for a sauna whisk and she was very pretty in her dress decorated with trinkets. Happily and with confidence he approached the girl and said playfully, Not for anyone else, young maiden, not for anyone else but me. Young maiden, wear that beaded necklace, or the crosslet on your bosom. Put your hair up in long braids, tie them round with silken ribbons. At first the young lass blushed from ear to ear, shyly averting her eyes, but then the red quickly vanished. Her cheeks went pale, and she turned her head slowly toward him. Her eyes met the old man's gentle and goodwilled gaze, and she hesitated, as if feeling for a brief moment the unexplainable warmth and power of those eyes. Then suddenly she tore herself free from her indecision and cried out, Not for you or anyone else. Will I wear this crosslet here, or tie my hair in silken ribbons? I don't care for foreign fashions, nor for wheat bread sliver sliced. I can go in plainer clothing and can live on heels and crusts, with my good and kindly father, and my mild and tender mother. Bursting into tears she snatched her trinkets and pearls, all her rings, ribbons and adornments, and flung them onto the earth, and before Vainamoinen had time to recover, the girl had run away. Reflecting upon this, falling into deep thought, Vainamoinen slowly returned home. He could not remove the vision of the young Aino from his eyes, and he could not erase all the nuances that had passed over her features. There was fright, beseeching, reproach, hate, and bitterness, and in it all there was still something else. The girl's emotions glittered brightly in his memory. But there was something mysterious in the background, something he did not understand. He did not understand the girl's behavior at all. Did he in any way harm Aino? Had he done something wrong? Was not Aino his own? Did not Jaukahainen promise his sister to him as ransom for his life? Should not moderation and justice be obeyed here, as the father's holy traditions decree? But the girl's eyes, and her intense and erratic feelings, he had never before encountered that kind of sight. Why was the girl frightened, reproachful, and why did she hate him? Was she already? And Vainamoinen stopped dead in his tracks as if struck by a lightning bolt. So strange was the thought that entered his mind. What if the girl was no longer completely a member of his family and tribe? What if the soul's strings were already being cut? 
What if she was already a human being, thinking for herself, becoming independent? But how could this be possible? No seer had taught the girl anything. Consequently, where could she have learned to think? Were humans now beginning to be born free? Was a new age coming? If this were so, then children were no longer the property of their parents, their family, or their tribe. They could be masters over themselves. Oh, if this were true, then he could understand Aino. Her human freedom had been hurt, and there was nothing to do but leave the girl alone. The old man sighed deeply. Goodbye, my fantasy. Goodbye, my fading dreams. But as he thought of Aino's distress, pity welled up in his heart. Her brother had sold the poor girl to his own enemy and she was not even consulted in the affair. What else could she do but be afraid of me and hate me? With a tear in his eye, pity and sorrow in his heart, Vainamoinen sat down on a rock. Again he asked himself how this was all possible, how the girl could have been born with the soul of a seer. Human beings really had not changed. The new race did not yet exist in the world. Yes, it would truly come someday, but not for a long time. Then his eyes opened and he saw beyond the veil of life and death. He saw a female child who went to school with a seer. The seer taught her to be an independently thinking and feeling human being, and she became attached to her teacher with the entire force of her young soul. But death suddenly came and swept the girl away just when her grateful heart was overflowing with the desire to reward her ear teacher. However, death could not stop the girl's heart. Her fantasy continued in Chuoma, dreaming and building castles in the air. And when the moment came, she reincarnated on the earth and was born as Aino. And in the seer Vainamoinen saw himself. Now the puzzle had been solved. Now it was clear that Aino was already a seer soul when she was born. And so it was natural that such a fate as she experienced made her bitter. One was not allowed to treat such souls as average human beings. They already looked at things from a different viewpoint. Certainly, the girl hated him because she did not recognize who Vainamoinen was. She did not remember her own past. Now the information had to get to the girl and her parents soon, and Jaukahainen must be released from his promise, for Aino's sake. Vainamoinen thought he had made a good resolution, but he did not feel happy. There was still something mysterious about Aino that he did not understand. This too became clear in time, but it became clear with a greater sorrow. What strange things of the heart now unfold, what message has been brought? Jalkahanan's young sister has drowned herself. Aino girl has sought solace from her peculiar sorrow in the sea waves. At first, Vainamoinen did not believe his ears, but when the ghastly truth fully dawned upon his consciousness, he, the old steadfast seer, was close to perishing from grief. Wept at evening, wept at morning. Nightly was his woe most grievous, for the fate of his own fair one, for the maiden who was sleeping, underneath the restless rollers, down beneath the sea waves deep. And for my part in this, sighed Vainamoinen, oh for my mindless, stupid, indiscretions, oh, a madman in my madness, dimwit with my vaunted manhood, once I had some common sense, well endowed with powers of thinking, gifted with a good heart also, but that was once upon a time, now in evil days like these, in this miserable generation, my mind is only mediocre, and my thoughts completely worthless, all my actions gone astray, because now he understood Aino. Her death made it clear what was mysterious about the scene of her flight. Aino did recognize him, she knew who he was, and loved him. Thus the one I always wanted, and awaited half a lifetime, to become my friend forever, and to be my lifelong helpmate, found her way onto my angle, and she landed in my boat. I had not the sense to keep her, take her home upon my sleigh, but I let her slip away, slip away beneath a billow, underneath the sea waves deep. So he could not keep his friend because he could not love himself. He did not understand the depth of love and now, through a death, this became clear to him. The child taught this to him. He, old and wise, did not understand the secret power of new love, the love that joins together two free, independent human souls. His own seer vision had not gazed that far into the future. But when self-love finally appeared, it chose for its dwelling the young woman's heart. It unfolded within the child's pure mind and taught it something that was hidden from the wise. And now the child, by voluntarily dying, had also saved the wise one from continuing in ignorance. Oh, the miraculous workings of fate, the creator's bottomless wisdom. Margetta There exists in the Kalvala a rune that refers to a future time as clearly as the Aino legend. This rune is thought to have been born during the age of Christian influence and created by the Christian imagination. 
This is the Kalevala's final rune, the 50th, which tells of Marjata and her son. Since the Marjata episode also joins with the final scene in Vainamoinen's life history, describing how Vainamoinen withdraws to make way for the impending new age, and thus continuing the Aino story through these events, we will take a brief look. Aino is born to an Atlantean family, into Atlantean conditions. But her soul belongs to the Aryan age and the Aryan race. She is already a thinking individual. But how fine and delicate are these new faculties within her? Her personal tendency is to retain a firm connection with her family. The love she has for her mother, father, brother and sister, her entire home, is quite moving. Her newborn Aryan individuality lives within her like a bird in a cage. It will awaken to highest consciousness only when it is deeply hurt. When she, a human being, is sold, her moral righteousness flares up and she comprehends her unhappy lot. But her awakening does not provoke her to positive action, only to passive opposition. The conflict reaches its apogee when she realizes that even Vainamoinen does not understand her. And when she simultaneously realizes her own soul's secret, her love for Vainamoinen, her fate turns tragic, it would have been better had I not been born at all. Her entire being becomes determined that nobody will be allowed to know what she, the poor girl, feels and thinks. This fixed idea finally takes her, without her even really knowing it, to suicide. No one knew me. None will grieve for me. In a sense, Aino is the apotheosis of virginity and fruitlessness. It is very different with Marjata. Marjata is truly Aino reincarnated, the aspiring to independence and personal self-preservation which in Aino is groping and unsure, achieves full self-consciousness in Marjata. But Marjata's fate will be different. She goes from infertile virginity to fertile motherhood, but experiences much grief and distress in the process. Marjata, the beautiful, for a long time grew at home, in her high-born father's house, in her loving mother's chambers. Thus the rune begins. And it tells us right away, somewhat derisively, exactly how self-consciously proud Marjata was of herself in her virgin purity. Marjata, the beautiful, she the little, dainty maiden, kept her virgin state untarnished, and her beauty all unblemished, always ate the nicest fish, and the softest pine bark bread, would not even taste of hen's eggs, hens that Chanticleer had mounted, would not eat the flesh of ewes, any ewe or ram had mounted. When her mother ordered her to milk the cows, she snobbishly answered, No girl such as I would do it. Touch the teats of any cow. Any cow a bull had mounted. It can't be unless the calves, or the heifers trickle milk. When brother asked sister to sit down in a sleigh that was pulled by a mare, the proud beauty replied, I won't hitch a horse. Any mare a stud has mounted. It can't be unless the foals, or the month-olds do the pulling. As a final result, Marjata, the youngest and most beautiful child, always living as a virgin, left to herd sheep. Now, if the rune wanted to mock the girl's virginity, it would have let the subsequent events unfold in a different manner. Instead, it emphasizes how Marjata's imagination was truly innocent and pure. The rune first provides a little critique. Marjata, the beautiful, stayed a shepherdess too long. It is hard to be a shepherdess, overmuch for any girl child. Snakes are slithering in the grasses, lizards wriggling here and there. And then the room begins to tell us a legend about Marjata's miraculous red lingonberry, the berry that she ate and became pregnant by. We see how Marjata, one summer day, fell into a deep sleep while lying on a little hill and had a beautiful dream in which a barricade on a hill, red hortleberry on a heath yelled to her, Come, maiden, pick me up. Marjata, pretty youngest child. Went a little distance, she went up to see the berry, pick the reddish lingonberry, pluck it with her dainty fingers, with her slender hands so lovely. She found the berry on the hill, red lingonberry on the heath. It's a berry in appearance, lingonberry by the shape, on a tree too high for picking, yet too low to climb up after. From the heath she snatched a stick, with it knocked the berry down. Then the berry started climbing, up onto her lovely shoe top, from her shoe top, to her knee, from her white knee, to her apron. Then it moved up to her waistband, from the waistband to her bosom, from her bosom to her chin, from her chin up to her lips. Then it slid into her mouth, tumbled quickly to her tongue, from her tongue into her throat, from her throat into her stomach. And that was Marjetta's dream. But the dream had a very real consequence. After that she was contented, and she felt herself fulfilled. Then she put on weight, grew stouter. 
Her dream of virgin purity had come to a bitter end. Soon, her mother began to suspect what was up, but hid her thoughts. When the day of distress finally arrived for Marjata, she asked her mother to warm up the sauna for her, but her own mother heartlessly answered, Woe to you, you whore of hazy. Tell me whose bed partner are you, married man or unmarried? For Marjata, the day of distress became a day of reckoning. All the mindless pride with which she had troubled her kin now was thrown back at her as a cold, judgmental, and merciless humiliation. What did it help to try to explain to her mother that she had become pregnant by her own faith? Her father also called her a harlot and ordered her out to find a bare stone dwelling to have her cubs in. So indeed, she did go away, but she cried out while going, still proud in her despair. I'm no whore, fit for hellfire. I'm the bearer of the Great One, deliverer of the sacred birth, man-child who will rule the rulers, even rule old Vainamoinen. Poor Marjetta, a mother's holy feelings had awakened in her. Now the rune abandons any mocking tone and with the greatest sympathy and compassion tells of Marjetta's difficult destiny. Not one human being would help her. Everyone fled from her. Alone and rejected, she went into the forest, to the room in the redwood forest, into the stable of Tapio's hill, and prayed for God to help her. Come, Creator, be my refuge, be my help, thou merciful, in these toils, these times of sorrow. And there she delivered her son, on the hay, near a horse, in the manger of the long mane. Then she washed, and swaddled him, took the man-child on her knees, held her son upon her lap. Oh, how she loved her little one, a child of sorrow and grief. Her virginal pride was forgotten, changed into a mother's pure humility. But she hid him from the people, cared for him, her lovely one. Golden apple, staff of silver, at her breast she suckled him, in caressing hands she held him. And when her son once got lost in a swamp, what distress and despair did she experience? Who could measure a mother's love, reflected in the bottomless abyss of worry? And who could draw lines around its joys? The child was found and brought home, but still there was one more worry. He was growing up so handsome, beautiful son of Marjetta. No one knew what name to give him, knew the proper name to call him. Mother would call him Little Flower. Others call him Good for Nothing. Thus, the child had to be christened. Now Vainamoinen steps onto the stage. Marjetta's son and Vainamoinen. Understood allegorically, the Marjetta legend quite dramatically describes the origin of the new race. The central events of the episode refer directly to it. A long period of intentional virginity, supernatural conception, social rejection, discrimination by the world, and difficult tribulations. When nature begins to create a new root race, it invigorates the inner souls of a few individuals of the old race with new dreams and longings, such that these individuals are set apart in their habits and understanding. Then its divine messengers and helpers arrive to impregnate the prepared souls with the ideals of the new human type. Ultimately, they are led to take up a separate place from the rest of humanity, where together they overcome their new troubles and obstacles and, through great sufferings and distress, all the while receiving divine aid, begin a new human race. This allegorical meaning of the Marjetta legend is confirmed in its final moment. The small child meets with Vainamoint. Vainamoinen, symbol of the old race's magic and educational method, says farewell to the newborn race and its new magic and departs from the world, though promising at the same time to return whenever he may be needed again. After all, he is ancient, wise, and experienced and is really like the new race's father. And this allegorical meaning is not negated even if we believe that this rune was formally constructed during the period of Christian influence. This symbolic spirit remains continuously in the background and must be kept in mind although we take the final event to also be the final chapter of Vainamoinen's personal life history. Vainamoinen truly was the seer and magician of the transitional age and after meeting Eno he understood that the old method of magical education would not apply to the human beings of the new age. But he considered Eno to be an exceptional being and he did not fully encounter the new race until fate brought him into connection with Marjat before a name could be given to Marjetta's son. The old man who was asked to christen the child explained that the child should first be examined. I won't christen one possessed, will not baptize this poor wretch. Should the child be examined to determine if he was of divine birth and to see if he could handle the school of fate? Yes, and who else could do this deed but old Vainamoinen? Who should be the one to judge him, to examine and to judge him? Old reliable Vainamoinen, eternal knower. He was chosen, 
to examine and to judge him. The old seer arrived, lost in deep thoughts. He arrived to give judgment over the child of the new age. But his steps were heavy and slow as if walking into a sacrificial grove, where the most precious treasure must be sacrificed. Or like a judge who must give grave judgment upon himself, from his own mouth. In his passing, his thoughts descended from heaven seriously, watchfully, with their expansive wings just lightly touching the earth. Will you endure, you, son of Marjetta, whose father is unknown? Will you bear the vision of your father? Can you avoid the sweet charm in his eyes? Are you truly the descendant of Aino, of Marjetta, the new human race born on the earth, conscious of your deeds, free from the past? Or will you, too, fall apart? Will you stagger, will you collapse, and will you pull your father down to doom? Have all your father's efforts been in vain? Is death the end of everything? Or will you be victorious, the divine hero? Has the new day truly dawned? Will you further the work of your father? Will you allow his wisdom to return after the allotted time, to make you happier? And Vainamoinen asks Marjetta, How was this son born, were conceived, and from who? And Marjetta told him. Then Vainamoinen spoke solemnly and gloomily. His voice secretly broken with sorrow and pronounced his sentence. Since the boy came from a fen, sired by a berry of the earth, let him be put in the earth, there beside the berry patch, or then taken to the swamp, hit on the head there with a club. The spectacle of the old seer was severely judgmental, gave a powerful impression, and it lingered in the eyes of the little child. The moment became a deep silence, a silence of waiting, hopelessness, and increasing distress. Then the child opened his mouth, and the half-month-old boy began to speak. Oh, you miserable old man, miserable old man, you stupid, what a muddle you have made, of both judgment and the law. Now even the seer's face brightened a little, then quickly became clouded with tears, but the severity disappeared. The boy continued defiantly, not for greater crimes committed, nor the stupidest wrongdoing, were you taken to a fen, hit on the head there with a club. Vainamoinen's face brightened more, and a supernatural joy flashed forth from it, while Marjetta's son continued speaking. When you yourself as a younger man, pledged the daughter of your mother, as a ransom for your own head, just to save yourself from danger. At this point the spell was broken and his eyes smiled quietly as he recalled Ilmarinen's first journey to Pojola, but the boy continued without mercy. And again you were not punished, were not taken to a fen. When you as a younger man drove those gentle girls distracted to their deaths beneath the waves on the black ooze of the bottom. Then the last suspicion, the final uncertainty, disappeared from Vainamoinen's mind. A tear rolled down his wrinkled cheek and a burden fell from his shoulders. Yes, my son, you are victorious. His heart whispered with joy and I am now free, free to leave without concerns, free to return joyfully. Thank and honor the Creator. So the old man baptized him, gladly christened this good child, king and lord of all Karelia. It appeared to the others that he was embarrassed and might become angry, but he walked to the beach and sang one last time, chanting for himself a copper boat. He sat down at the stern and sailed out into the clear open sea, and as he sailed in his boat to the upper worldly regions, through the lower realms of heaven, he uttered the following spell. Let the rope of time run out. One day go, another come, and again I will be needed. They'll be waiting, yearning for me, to bring back another Sampo, to invent another harp, set a new moon in the sky, free a new sun in the heavens, when there is no moon, no sun, and no gladness on the earth. Vainamoinen's Return, the National Occult Key Vainamoinen and the Nation of Finland of all the Kalevala's heroes, Vainamoinen is the first and most superior, the one closest to the heart of the runesinger. Everyone loves and admires him, and feels that he evokes the deepest aspirations within the spirit of the nation of Finland. Personified in him one finds our family's love of knowledge and wisdom, song and poetry, and our faith in the power of words and music. Vainamoinen's indomitable firmness, steadiness in all decisions, his invincible moderation and calmness represent in the Finn's eyes the ideal character. This is no miracle because within Vainamoinen's personality is hidden the secret which, in a somewhat peculiar manner, makes him the father, the prototype, of our whole nation. The keys of interpretation we have used up until now have either generalized his personality or drew it into view as very human. In other words, we have seen him as a god or a human being but not first and foremost as a Finn. 
the key that we now intend to use leaves Vainamoinen halfway between heaven and earth but makes him that full-blooded Finn that every child of the Finnish nation feels close to. This key is the occult national key. Above all, it means that the spirit and soul of Finland, our so-called national spirit, is symbolized by Vainamoinen. Our nation's deepest intention, deepest faith, and deepest love is personified by him. But it also means something else. It means that Vainamoinen, as a divine pagan, is not dead but lives on. That as a representative of Finland's national spirit he is not just a poetic image, but a living personal reality. How should this be understood? Since here we touch upon secret aspects of the invisible world, we must offer an explanation. National differences, those both external and internal, include language, geography, natural conditions, climate, and other noble factors. Every nation forms a unified entity which in the invisible world takes the form of its overarching mental ambience or aura. Specific and distinctive inner features are contained in a nation's aura, such as temperament, modes of thought, the capacity to feel, mental endeavors, artistic predispositions, and so on, which together make up what we may call a nation's personal soul. But a spiritual secret is hidden behind this collective national soul, in the same way that the human being has a higher eye whose temporary expression is the personality. So also a nation has a collective spiritual entity holding things together like an autonomous thinking being, and we can call this the national genius. This is an independent being who does not belong to the human developmental system, but to another order, the so-called angelic hierarchies, which in Sanskrit are called devas. He is a comparatively high being in his own system and has acquired, perhaps only to further his own development, the lifelong duty of caring for a nation's destiny and leading its spiritual growth. His chosen nation is precious and close to his heart and there exists in its character something which corresponds to his own nature. And becoming the leader of a nation, moreover, its servant, is a difficult task requiring great responsibility. In a sense, the nation's aura becomes like his external body or dwelling place, and he absorbs the nation's soul life into his own. Thus begins a continuous interplay between the nation's personal soul and the guardian angel's own consciousness. The angel tries to nurture the nation's soul and dispense throughout its aura his own sublime inspirations and feelings. He cannot immediately affect the entire incarnated population of the nation. Only the individuals who, filled with love for their native country, hear his voice, will go forth to express his words and willpower through heroic deeds, literature, and the arts. Of course the guardian angel is not alone, but is surrounded by a mighty group of assistants, angels and genii in the lower levels. However, underlying the deepest spiritual love for the native country is this grandiose, loving, and divine being who awakens and responds to love within individuals. Is it surprising that some nations worship him as their only god? Since Vainamoinen represents Finland's national genius, this also means that he personifies the soul life of Finland, and that Vainamoinen, the Vainamoinen of the runes and the old religion of the Kalvala, is the guardian angel given to the Finnish nation. At what moment Vainamoinen joined his own fate with that of Finland, we cannot exactly say. It happened in an era beyond recorded history, in a Kalvalan epoch when the culture of our ancestors flourished. We examine the stories found in the Kalvala's runes regarding the phases of Vainamoinen's life, looking for references to the life cycle and fate of our guardian angel. Long ago, Finland's family was large and powerful. It encompassed the ancestors of the modern Finns, as well as the ancestors of the Laps and other tribes of the Finnish family. It reigned over a large part of Europe and it ruled more through the power of wisdom than by violence. Its civilization was by nature more mental than material and quality. Its people practiced agriculture, hunting, fishing, trade, pursued a variety of livelihoods, but they were also, at the same time, a sensitive, religious, and musical people. For them life would have no value without song and poetry, without a deeper knowledge of nature and the seer's skills. Their seers were initiated into a high and mysterious wisdom and were famous for their mighty faculty of incantation. It was the Kalvala's culture, and those were the ages of Vainamoinen. Then changes took place and upheavals occurred. Other nations appeared on the stage of history. Vainamoinen drew aside, his realm dissolved. But his people, in groups, and over long periods of time, moved to the north and into the peninsula of Finland. People came to the areas of Haim, Kerlia, Kainu, Perkala, and Perm, and are known by those names today. 
The ancient times were preserved in their memories. During the long winters they made poetry and sang about those ancient times. And miracle of miracles, they strongly believed that the ancient glory would someday return. The memory of Vainamoinen's promise to return became a tradition. Later, after Christianity arrived in Finland and the people were taught to reject their ancient gods, Vainamoinen's withdrawal was connected in the runes to the Christian invasion, but the prophecy was not forgotten. Up until our own times the prophecy echoed upon people's lips, the farewell words of the ancient Vainamoinen, the eternal sage. Let the rope of time run out. One day go, another come, and again I will be needed. They'll be waiting, yearning for me, to bring back another Sampo. To invent another harp, set a new moon in the sky, free a new sun in the heavens, when there is no moon, no sun, and no gladness on the earth. How should we understand Vainamoinen's promise? Does it have true meaning? Does it contain a higher reality? Is it a real tradition or was it just created in the imaginations of rune singers? We already argued that it is not from that critical period of pagan and Christian transition, but is from a much older age. It refers to the beginning of the Colorvo period. 3. And we are convinced that it is a true promise, given by our national genius Vainamoinen through a human Vainamoinen inspired by him. And so we can ask, if it is true that our national genius did not completely withdraw forever, what guarantee do we have that he will return, and when might that take place? Our answer is that things will not happen quite the way they did in the past. When Vainamoinen previously led the Finnish tribes he was in a sense the organizer of the group soul. His realm was gathered together from different elements or, better said, from different possibilities within different groups. Since then, Europe has changed a great deal. When he returns, Vainamoinen must choose a special tribe of the Finnish family. He must have an elite nation, a chosen nation. Where will he find this and when will Vainamoinen return? Vainamoinen has already returned and he has already chosen his nation. The nation is the nation of Finland and Vainamoinen's return took place after the Middle Ages came to a close and a new age dawned in Europe as a whole. In the words of the Kalvala we can trace how our national genius and guardian angel has gradually joined with our modern national spirit. And again I will be needed. Yes, he will be needed when the new age dawns and the nations of Europe move into a freer and more civilized future. This happened, as we said, at the end of the Middle Ages and the effect of Vainamoinen is evident in Mikhail Agricola's work and in other places. They'll be waiting, yearning for me. And this happened when our nation's selfhood awoke and began to feel its own unique stature, at the same time wishing for freer political circumstances and living conditions. The first stirrings of this aspiration occurred a few hundred years ago and consequently we saw the inner separation of Finland from Sweden and its joining with the realm of Russia a monumental advance for the nation of Finland to bring back another Sampo. This occurred when the nation of Finland was spiritually prepared enough to retrieve the memories of the ancient Finnish culture. And this took place in the last century when Elias Lonrod, above all others, was chosen as Vainamoinen's tool. As a result, his Kalevala and all the other runes, spells, and proverbs which have been gathered together comprise the new Sampo given to us by Vainamoinen. To invent another harp, after we receive the new Sampo, that is the Kalevala, and the ancient memories are awakened within our national soul, we begin an independent cultural project in the sciences, arts, religion, philosophy, and so on. This began to occur in the last century too, after the Kalevala's publication, and since then Finland has truly made many original contributions in many cultural areas. The great civilized countries already hold Finnish music, literature, architecture, and other Finnish achievements in high regard. Vainamoinen was not deceitful, his words have come true. To set a new moon in the sky, free a new sun in the heavens, when there is no moon, no sun, and no gladness on the earth. This takes place when our nation, formed by hard-won experiences, suffers pain and distress along with the rest of the world. Modern Europe really is suffering the birth pains of a tremendous labor. And it is generally believed that a new and better era will dawn after we have passed through a modern purgatory. In this aspect, Vainamoinen's promise has not yet come true, but we trust that he was not wrong even in this. For Finland the day will come, the day of brotherhood among all nations, when every nation is allowed without contest to manifest its holiest, innermost being. Then our nation will have the opportunity and a duty to obey the call of its own genius and create an independent, genuine Finnish civilization in all aspects of life.
Now the reader must not shout out, is the ancient Vainamoinen really our guardian angel? As he returned, and will he step to the side of Christ? Vainamoinen is not pagan or Christian any more than Christ is. Vainamoinen, as the essence of our national genius, is a living though secret reality. And if by Christ we mean the Logos, then Vainamoinen is naturally his servant. If, however, by Christ we mean the great initiated seer who in the person of Jesus wandered over the earth a few thousand years ago, then he is a being of a different type altogether compared to Vainamoinen, who we understand to be our national genius and not a member of humanity at all. As such, the work of Christ is by no means in conflict with the influence of Vainamoinen, expressing itself as it does in the independent development of the Finnish nation. In the reality of life, in the development of nations and individuals, it is not a question of one or another type of faith. All religions and worldviews are brothers, branches and leaves of the same tree of wisdom and life. It is merely a question of looking at the different types of individuals and the different activities of each nation. But if a nation wants to create a spirited civilization with happy citizens, it is unavoidable that a deep connection with the secret world of wisdom must be maintained. As long as the ancient nations performed their mysteries of communion in the Holy Sampo Temple of the Secret Brotherhood of Wisdom, then their civilization continued to bear fruit. But when the connection broke, the different nations were forced to go their own misguided ways and culture degenerated. In the Christian age the church takes the place of the ancient mysteries, its function being part church, part university. Initially the church maintained its inner relationship with Jesus and the secret world in general. But over the centuries the connection loosened, until today very few Christians are the personal disciples of Jesus. Six and even those are not from the church's inner circle, whether it happens within the church or outside of it. The ancient mysteries must be revived from their deathly state and restored to their previous condition of union with Jesus and the secret brotherhood of modern Christianity wants to continue developing with spirit. And this renaissance of the ancient mysteries can only take place when each nation finds its higher self. The past century prepared Christianity for this, and we Finns know it from our own history. For each nation, discovering its higher self means that out of the oblivion of night everything from its ancient past that was spirited, noble, and beautiful will be raised into the daylight. And mere recollecting is not enough here. The ancient spirit must be renewed and invigorated, reborn into national consciousness. Therefore, Vainamoinen's return to the nation of Finland means the revivification of ancient memories, the forging of the new Sampo, and so on. Now the duty of the nation of Finland is to re-enliven the spirit and wisdom of Vainamoinen and infuse it with the consciousness that modern Christendom has already nurtured and educated. And the 20th century will witness to what extent Finland and the other nations as well accomplish this grand work. We have Vainamoinen's promise that he, our dear national genius, will do for his part what duty requires, that we can be sure of. Now I ought to shut my mouth and tie up my tongue tightly, stop the singing of the song and the echoing of my voice, not even the swiftest rapids, ever runs out all its water, nor does any expert singer, ever pour out all his wisdom. To hold back a song is better, than to cut it short halfway. Do not think it odd, good people, that a child should sing too much, such a little one pipe badly. I have never been instructed, nor have learned in wizard lands, borrowed charm words from outsiders, nor my spells from far off places, but however that may be, I have skied a trail for singers, skied the trail, snapped the brush tips, broke the branches, showed the way. That way now will run the future, on the new course, cleared and ready, for new poets of greater power, singing songs of mightier magic, for the rising younger people, for the new and growing nation. This is the end of Pekka Urvast's Key to the Kilvala.